Pairing is a critical step in ABA so that a child will want to come work with you. This video blog is all about how to use pairing effectively. So pairing is all really about relationship building. And if you think about any relationship in your life that you're looking to build on, you don't start with the goal. You start with getting to know them, right? Think about dating. Um, you don't meet someone for the first time and say, you know, do you want to move in with me or do you want to get married? You court each other, you get to know each other, you build a relationship. Same thing with if you're hiring a new employee, you don't start with offering them a contract. You get to know them, you bring them in, you have an in-person visit, you would interview them. So you start with a relationship and it's the same thing for our kids. You know, our goal is to go in there and teach them skills very much so, but without building that relationship, it's not, it's not the right way to come in and start with the skills. We need to start with the relationship and then be able to teach those skills. Someone told me a long time ago that kids should be running to you, not away from you. And if you've got students who are saying, goodbye, Shana, bye, Shana, bye, Shana, you obviously know you haven't paired effectively. Um, I think it's great. They've got language skills and they can express their needs, but they definitely want, you want them to be running towards you. You want them to be saying, what do you have in your bag today? What are we doing today? Let's play. Come on, you're fun. And you want us to be a signal of reinforcement. And pairing is so much more than just taking the first few sessions to um, get to know each other or to be the giver of good things. Pairing is ongoing. And sometimes we get the question of how long do I pair for? And the answer is always like the relationship needs to be there. And it's an ongoing process of building the relationship. It's not something that you could say, well, I paired for two hours and now I'm done. Now we move on. Um, it's not a one and done. It's not just about being the giver of reinforcement. It's about having a relationship where there's trust, where there's fun, where you both, you know, understand each other. None of those are behavioral terms I know, but it's, it's so important that child really has to feel comfortable with you. And you have to understand them sometimes, especially if they're, you know, non-vocal or they can't express themselves, understanding their body language or their gestures and being able to make them feel comfortable with you. What drives you crazy is that when people go in and they say, okay, I'm pairing myself with reinforcement for, you know, a day, two days, sometimes even a month, people say, well, I'm still pairing, I'm working on pairing. Or if someone doesn't have a program together, they'll say, well, we're just pairing right now. Like, okay, well, pair, but you also have put some demand on because if you don't, if you pair for too long and then you go to put even one demand on kids, aren't going to want to do that. But at the same time, if you always start with that demand and you never pair, like Shira said, pairing needs to be ongoing, then, you know, your learner is going to go, whoa, whoa, wait a second. So I think what we need to talk about is what is the right balance between pairing and quote unquote work or demand. Right. So pairing does not mean that they get to, you know, wreak havoc and have complete control over everything that goes on. Um, It really doesn't. It just means letting them guide the relationship a little bit, taking cues from them, seeing what they're comfortable with, um, starting to get to know what their preferences are and starting to offer those preferences with very little demand. Um, You really like coloring? Great. Let's sit at this table and color. You don't have to first do something to get the coloring, but maybe you just have to sit at the table with me. Um, You know, starting to offer those good things and starting to do things that they enjoy together so that you become part of that fun activity. When I go into someone's home or if they're coming to me in a clinic setting, I typically have a bag of tricks. It might be a basket of, of toys. It might be a bag. Um, it might be a shelf full of things that I, you know, I'm only offering one at a time. Um, but I'm really trying to see what their preferences are. Do I do a formal preference assessment the very first day I meet somebody? No, absolutely not. But what I am doing is pulling items out of my bag or pulling bins off a shelf and opening up, opening them up and showing, you know, the individual I'm working with. So I can really get a sense of what they like. And sometimes they may not like coloring, but you know, when the crayon flies up in the air and I catch it and or not catch it, because I typically don't, and they laugh, well, then all of a sudden, you know, they like the crayon. So it might not be about the activity of coloring, but it might be about making that fun somehow. Or, you know, I've had people who are, you know, turning the page and saying, oh, hey, like I like this Peppa, Peppa Pig coloring book, you know, and they turn the page to something, oh, don't look there. And just my reaction, oh, don't look there is enough to make them giggle. So sometimes it's not about just playing with, you know, toys with them, but it's about how do you make this toy fun? with me being involved. The toy is way more fun when I'm 
involved versus when you're playing it by yourself. And something that a lot of us tend to do because we're adults and when we pair with people, we tend to talk a lot and we tend to ask each other questions, but Pairing with some of our kids doesn't have to have a lot of language. Sometimes that comes across as a demand. So don't think that you need to meet your student and all of a sudden go, well, what's your name? What's your favorite color? What's your favorite toy? What do you like? Where do you live? And, you know, you're trying to make conversation, but that could be aversive. So think about pairing as just your presence. Your presence is enough being fun, being safe, being calm, being comfortable and starting to understand the child's body cues, their body language, how they're feeling, knowing when to, you know, take a step back because they might be feeling a little nervous, knowing when to push a little bit. And with your goal being that slowly over time, you can start to um, bring in more teaching, more skills, a little bit more demands as they're comfortable and knowing what that dance is of like when you can push them and when they might need a little bit of a break. Such a great point, Shira, and pairing should be individualized to the learner. So you've got some learners who love over the top silliness, and that's when you can go, oh, don't look at that picture. And then you've got other learners who can't tolerate loud noises or any type of surprises whatsoever. And that's when you have to go in with a very calm voice and, you know, maybe some deep pressure squeezes, maybe some arm squeezes or some hand squeezes um, to really get them to feel comfortable around you, you know, might be giving them more sensory toys versus, you know, uh, play or toy, little toy activities that they can do pretend play with. So you really do have to judge the learner. And uh, sometimes just asking the parent or the caregiver ahead of time, hey, what do they like? Or, you know, give me a little bit of sense of who they are can help you out during that initial pairing session. Yeah. And we have a student who we've been working with for years. So we've definitely paired at the beginning and, you know, we're seeing that he's starting to have a lot of challenging behavior. And instead of choosing to like, we're going to put through and we're going to just follow through with all demands, we decided to just back off and, you know, repair this relationship needs to be rebuilt. It's an ongoing process and something must might be falling apart in that relationship if we're seeing some of this challenging behavior. So our decision was to, you know, kind of repair, rebuild that relationship. Let's just do what he wants to do for a little while. And that might seem counterintuitive to like, well, you need to follow through, but the relationship is more important than that. And we have to build that before we can build any of the other, you know, follow through or demands. And I really do think that once you've built the relationship, follow through comes and it comes naturally because if you've got the relationship, you know, you want to please, you know, people want to please you if you've got that relationship. Um, and sometimes pairing can be, you know, a couple of days at the beginning. Sometimes it's okay. Well, let's take a week off of programming and do some more pairing to repair that relationship. But honestly, I usually typically pair, you know, at the beginning of every session for even two to three minutes at a time, you know, a student comes into the center and, you know, doesn't just sit at the table and all of a sudden we do work, you know, the, ta- you know, student comes into the center and maybe I've got a play activity on the table first and we do, do a little bit of playing or, you know, the student may, you know, be on the floor and I, you know, go over and instead of going, hi, how are you? How was your day? Blah, blah, blah. I just gently offer arm squeezes because I know the student likes deep pressure and then I get into things. Um, the other thing too, that I see often is that therapists, you know, once you've got, you know, once you've paired with a student and, you know, you're in the, in the process of doing, you know, more work activities, I see a lot of therapists who send kids off during their quote unquote break. So it's like, okay, well, let's do some work or, you know, learning time. And then, okay, you go play by yourself and I'm going to hang out here and, you know, organize my notes or take data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And I, shudder actually when I see that because that's such a great opportunity to continue that pairing process right so instead of okay well you go play sure some kids need their alone time sometimes but a lot of the time it's like hey let's go play together here's my fun time I know I got to teach you this stuff but let's go have fun together too and how cool is that like that's what you get to do for a living like you get to play with kids how fun Yeah. So we've talked about why pairing is so important, why it will really make your sessions a lot more successful, how to approach pairing and really how to sometimes take a step back and repair or rebuild that relationship when you're teaching skills. So click on the link in around in or around this video to get a reinforcer checklist.